maybe you could be a construction fusion, right? Where you could specialize instead of just worldwide and, and bionic integration, just to know what's coming down the line. That would be good. I love Interest. this. All right. We are, li we are live. We are live and now it's recorded. Zach just came up with my new career. I'm going to be a construction futurist. Game on, trademark that. I love it. Zach, it's awesome. Um, so hello, welcome to lunch. I'm Kaylee McCabe, co-host with this week, my uh, fill in awesome co-host, Zach Fields from Sefka. How are you doing this week, Zach? I'm doing fantastic, Kaylee. It's great to be here. I love filling in wherever I can. Um, you are just a a ton of fun, and and I love um, that we get to do this segment. Uh, I know that I love that Sefka does this segment weekly. I'm glad I get to be a part of it sometimes, just showcasing uh, the great opportunities in our industry and and, and partners and uh, and all of that. So looking forward to getting into that today. Yeah, no doubt. It is. It's always fun, and you know we'll probably have to send Scott on vacation more often to be like, oh, Zach has to fill in. Um, yeah, right? right. But but before we get started, you know, usually to give our fan base a little bit of time to log in since we go live. I do take a moment to geek out about a tool or something and Zach, you know, okay. My, well, I will never have a tool cooler than that chisel you showed me that like, forever. I just have to go buy one now just to like hang it on a wall. I'm so jealous. Um, and so, you know, today it, I woke up to snow and I didn't want to go outside to my garage. <laughs> So I actually thought of something that's pretty handy that I have used and uh, because it's snow and cold, uh, <laughs> um, it does work on shovels, just by the way, uh, not all shovels, but some of them. So I know you don't get a lot in Georgia. <laughs> but, <laughs> and it wasn't just because I turned around. I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> hey, anything can be used as a tool. All right. So it's all about solving problems with what you have around you, right? That's the ingenuity of our industry and what our people do. So I love that you just grabbed that Pam out of the trash can. It's probably empty and, uh, and pulled it up. So that's fantastic. Hey, you know, I can uh, segue into just about anything like our guest this afternoon, because, you know, being able to look around and have a very convenient space to live in and be able to pull items from is something that I almost take for granted. I think a lot of people do. And you really don't talk about how important the role of architecture is in this industry. And I'm so excited that we finally have an architect on because we have been focused on, you know, more job site work and then also teachers. But Zach, I'm really excited about our guest today. I am too. You know, one thing I used to tell my students um, in messaging about our industry is that we're all interconnected. There are so many um, things that are connected to construction. It's so much more than while we honor and hold those people in high esteem that are swinging those tools out there on the front lines, there's a lot of people that are all connected that make that happen. And it doesn't start without an idea, right? And then the same beautiful thing about that, you know, us being able to create and make things is that we can bring ideas to life. And I love that the start of that for, for every project in our industry is an architect putting in, putting someone's vision or even their own on paper and, and, and us going out, to, to build it. It's, it's working as a team. So I really love that about that, our industry. I love that we have an architect on us as, as well. Me too. And, you know, getting to talk with Greg Walker from Hauser Walker is a treat and a half because, you know, it's, oh my, it's the person who created the art that, that I get to create with my hands. You know, it's just, it's such a wonderful relationship and, you know, really being able to utilize the lunch with Sefka to talk about all these different careers to hopefully inspire, you know, are you breathing? come join us. There's a career for everybody. And so, yeah, today I'm very excited to see um, not only, well, talk to Greg, but then also see some of the work that they've done. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, and there's a lot of students out there, you know, where, where can a kid be introduced to this? You know, there's a lot of different ways, um, you know, since, since Zach's on today, we're going to talk, I'm going to, you know, take a moment to plug our K-12 pipeline operation, which is a series of, of classes and programs uh, carried out through through our school system here in Georgia, over 20,000 kids are participating. But you know, there's there's a class where a kid that wants to be a future architect can can get their start in in building information modeling or computer aided design or CAD and and learn learn both sides, the building and the creating, so that later on they can make a great choice in what they want to do. And we have classes that focus on engineering, and we also have we have drafting programs where students are learning this in high school, getting prepped to take the next step, whatever that may be for them. Uh, and so we, we love the architecture, drafting and design um, programs and, and, and just the fact that it's an opportunity 
for every kid that's sitting in our class as well. Oh, it's absolutely yeah. awesome. I'm happy, I'm happy you brought that up, Zach. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, hey, real quick, will you be hanging out for the show or will I just get to hang out with you at the beginning next week? Um, well, for for today, I'm only hanging out now and I, and I won't be back on at the end, but I'm going to watch online. I've got a lunch. Actually, I'm going to go read a book. Do you know what book I'm reading, Kayleen? <laughs> no Check clue. Animal architecture, right? Oh, so cool. how animals don't in the uh in the natural world they've been refining it for thousands of years and um there's there's some really cool animals or insects out there like some flies that build their own house out of stone and rocks while they're larvae to protect them and there's these caterpillars that saw off little branches and build log cabins on their backs while they crawl around just really cool stuff like that um so whether you're an insect when you're a cat today uh or or a real person we've got something for you so uh really excited to tune in and watch the rest of this I'm totally buying that brux happy morning out zach and we will talk to you later bye-bye yeah, bye-bye and now we are joined by greg walker greg how are you doing today thanks Hi. for joining us hello doing good thank you for having me i am so thrilled to join us and like i was talking to zach earlier you know I am a nerd for the power tools and being on the job site, but I would not yeah. have a job without you. And so well, it, thank you. It's, it's wonderful to meet you. Now, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? And then I also want to talk about the portfolio of Hauser Walker. Okay. Well, so um, I am an architect, uh, as you said. Um, I'm a partner in a firm in Atlanta called Hauser Walker Architecture. Um, and I probably, from a career standpoint, I've had a, what, what would be considered a pretty traditional career path. So um, I went to school um, to study architecture, uh, did kind of an internship you know, with um, firms and got a license and eventually came out and started my own firm. So from that standpoint, very traditional kind of uh, career path, but been doing it since 19. 1989 so that seems like an awful long time now no it doesn't actually some of us think like that was just yeah. yesterday don't worry yep. Yep. <laughs> um I absolutely love it because you know there are so many steps in constructing a building but mm -hmm. it really all starts with the plan you know mm -hmm. <laughs> although I've met a lot of homeowners who just do demo with that one but that's a story for another, that's another story <laughs> yeah. yes um, but what do property owners need to know before they come to talk to you um, about a plan? Yeah, so a lot of what we love to get when we talk to owners, whether they're residential owners or whether they're commercial uh, owners, like a, anything from an office building or we work with museums and uh, libraries and, and other churches and clients like that. Um, what we love to get is a really strong idea of what you want the building um, to, to do for you, not just in sort of the immediate term, but as much as you can, like for the next 10 years, because we tend to think in long term mm -hmm. um, uh, for most of our projects. So we want to kind of have a strong idea of what that building represents to you, kind of what it needs to do for you in the big picture. And then we can kind of help you fill in all of the little picture uh, pieces. So we can sit there and tell you um, how to uh, uh, do a little bit of um, uh, the fine, fine tuning on the program. So, you know, if you know you need um, three bedrooms or four bedrooms, that's great. But if you need to know, where am I going to put my toothbrush holder, you know, when it comes up to the mirror? Uh, we'll help you figure that kind of stuff out. We don't need to know that quite right away, but we really do need to know, I really want three bedrooms or I want four bedrooms. That's fantastic because people do get overwhelmed in the minutia of the details. Yes. And uh, I don't know, I do have OCD. It needs to be to the right. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah. um, but you're right because it, it gets so overwhelming. And I think a lot of people, I don't know where they got this impression from <laughs> television shows, but they think that they can just... Uh, kind of plan things out and they don't realize how overwhelming it is. It's a huge yeah. undertaking. And in fact, right now we have up some blueprints, oh. um, or we did all we the time. Them, Mitch, they went away. Right? <laughs> I'll look at my nose and bring them back. Um, it's amazing because this really shows the complexity of what happens. Yeah. And then it turns into a space like this. What, 
What are we looking at here? So this was actually a drawing uh, for a project uh, at the University of West Georgia. It was for their main library. And we are looking at uh, what's called a reflected ceiling plan. But basically, if I were lying on the ground and I'm looking straight up at the ceiling, you know, what am I sort of seeing? And so this was a drawing uh, that our office produced to tell the contractor here's where all of the mechanical ducting needs to go. So all of the red was the mechanical ducting. All of the yellow rectangles that you see were the lights. And what was really important to us was there was a big central area there um, that, that looks like a little curvy thing kind of weaving mm -hmm. throughout the space where we wanted to go back and expose the original concrete ceiling and have it be shut off and get a little bit more volume in the space, but we didn't want all the mechanical ducts just cutting across haphazardly or something. So we did this very detailed drawing to tell the contractor, here's how all these pieces need to interrelate and be put together so that we can get this really nice clear ceiling at the end. Ah. And so this was kind of like a, a high level of, de you know, of yeah. detail for something just to get a kind of final effect. It is, I mean, okay, I, um, I understand completely that homeowners and most folks look at blueprints and have no idea what it's going to look like at the end. And that's but that, okay. <laughs> to me, that thing is beautiful. That's a beautiful blueprint. And so what, what stage is that project in? So that project we finished almost 10 years ago. That's oh, been built. It's been built. It's been built. Oh, been built. sweet. What other, um, what other projects, um, can we show off? This is so fun. Ooh. Yeah, so so our firm, um, as Mitch is pulling this up, a lot of the projects that we tend to do uh, tend to be places where people gather and where people come together, um, a lot of public projects in that way. So uh, the first one you saw there was some work we did for the Chattahoochee Nature Center. Um, not built yet, but um, part of their long range plan. We do a lot of libraries. This is down in Palmetto, Georgia. It was finished about five years ago, but it's a public library. Um, and then, you know, every now and then we get some really interesting projects. This was um, the Fernbank Children's, uh, an exhibit inside the Fernbank uh, Children's Playroom, Fernbank Museum Children's Playroom um, that we did with an, an exhibition designer. And then we did another little play tree house over for a Chastain Park. It opened about three years ago, a lot of timber in that one. And then a lot of what we've been asked to do um, more recently, and I think we're gonna continue to see for the next foreseeable future, is to renovate old buildings and to make them more uh, productive. So this was actually a 1970s office building um, that looked like a 1970s office. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, that we just finished converting. It is a net zero energy uh, headquarters for a group called ASHRAE, um, who writes all of the mechanical engineering standards that every code, you know, co uh, code group in the world um, tends to use. So we didn't really have a very big budget on this project, but we, we tried to maximize it by creating, you know, a lot of great views. They had a lake behind the property. This is out in uh, Peachtree uh, corners. And um, what we did was spend a lot of time really thinking through the building systems and creating a very efficient um, new building envelope for the structure so that it used a lot less energy up front. Um, in fact, it will be probably one of the lowest energy consumption office buildings in the southeast as they kind of fully occupy it. Um, and you know, what we did is drive down that energy use up front so that we could then, uh, uh, you know, create smaller systems and then we could power the whole thing by solar panels. <laughs> we're really excited about that one. Yeah, and that's exciting. Uh, <clears throat> you want to come to my shop in Colorado? Uh <laughs> <laughs> sure. Wow. Um, I'd love to get out of Colorado. It's been forever. Um, the, this, this was a little project we did for Georgia Tech. So every now and then we'll get called in to um, soup something up. So the Georgia Tech had a, uh, a, an off the shelf design, which was this little steel tower. And they said, well, you know, look, we don't want this in the middle of our campus looking this boring. You know, we're gonna give you like 30,000 bucks. Can you do something with it? And so for 30,000 bucks, we came up with this little screen system. Uh, the then president, Fred Peterson, inaugurated it by flying through the air. <laughs> um, along with Buzz, um, but you know, we just tried to take a little bit of money and 
and create a little bit more pop and a little bit more kind of uh, visual interest. And I think the last one here is um, a public project that we opened up uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. But again, this was repurposing um, a public library that had been uh, in a city, Alpharetta, um, that's just north of Atlanta. It had been a 1980s building by really kind of a noted, um, uh, an Atlanta architect who's been really noted for his houses here. Um, so we took that and converted it into now a, a studio art center. So it's got gallery space, which you see here in the foreground, but it's got a lot of studios in the back where the community can come in and do ceramics or they can do filmmaking or they can do theater productions or they can uh, paint or, you know, just get their hands dirty and, and do a lot of kind of fun uh, activities in the back. Oh, I love this so much. You know, um, I, I don't know if this, I don't know, all the spaces that you just showed off, it's really wonderful on how you like to gather people. It's almost like Dude, a chef yeah. who wants to feed a good meal. Like, yeah, you got to have the audience. <laughs> so you yes. want them there. But I mean, these spaces are gorgeous and the opportunity like, for people to gather and then walk around your art is absolutely incredible. This is well, amazing. And it's a lot of fun for us. I mean, we love, we love doing that kind of work. We love doing work in the public realm. And, and like I said, I mean, that was really the driver when we opened shop back in 2004 was we, we really wanted to focus on creating better public spaces um, uh, for our community and, you know, for other communities around the country. It's absolutely fantastic. You know, so we are we are talking a bit more about the commercial side. Can you mm -hmm. can you talk about yeah. residential yeah. commercial um, architecture? Just because some people don't know there's a difference. Yeah, yeah. And, and we do we've done both. We do both. Um, we have a house uh, in bidding right now, which, as we all know, is <laughs> a fun <laughs> adventure. <laughs> a fun adventure in and of itself. Like um, just trying to keep up with pricing. But yeah, the biggest difference is between what you're going to see when you when you look at a commercial project or a, a residential project. Start with the code. Um, the the building code for residential is thorough, but it's not nearly as intensive as a commercial code because you do have if you have 500 people in an auditorium and I need to get them out because there's a fire. That is a totally different equation than I've got a fire in the kitchen of my house and I need to get everybody out. So the codes are really structured to be residential or everything else. Um, and then when we work with homeowners, I think the biggest difference is, um, you know, a lot of our commercial clients are very heavily invested and, 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 they, and, and this is very personal to them. But in most cases, you're kind of a step removed, right? You're representing a company and this entity that's not you. When you go work with a homeowner, it's a very intense, personal, um, thing. I mean, this is where we all live. This is where we all wake up and you want every little thing to be right. So we do, we, we, we tend to adjust how we work a little bit with people. You know, we know we're going to spend a little bit more time with homeowners and in a little different way um, because they're just so heavily invested in that project. That is wonderful to hear because I think sometimes construction or the whole process gets a bad rap because there's a lack of communication and expectation mm -hmm. being set. And so what a nice thing for your clients to know and recognize that, yeah, you, you have to, because really. You like, have to. Yeah. Yes. It's, you know, it's, the it's CEO in that office building is not going to be staring at the carpet all the time. <laughs> not quite all the time. Although, yes. you know, like I said, there are a lot of people, especially when we get to, um, you know, when you get to a project like a church or you get to a project like a, um, an, an office, you know, a private office building for a, a smaller kind of held company, they'll definitely have, you know, we definitely have clients who, who care a lot, you know, and they'll, they are looking at the carpet and it's like, okay, that carpet's like a, a half a degree off in this orientation. Can we get that fixed? You know, and, and there are definitely people that, that will spend that time. And, and, and really, those are the people that we love working with. I mean, we love being pushed, having demanding clients that, that aren't negatively demanding. But you know, if they want you to elevate your game, if they want you to, to do better, like we're, we're all over that. We will take that client all day, every day. Ah, this is so exciting. How cool. Now, okay, pretend I'm a student watching this. Because yep. I'm already jazzed. I'm going to pretend I'm a student. I want to work for you. Yep. How, how would I even go about 
becoming an architect or researching? Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of great tools out there. I would say if you're researching what you can do in architecture, um, I'd start with uh, the professional group, which is called the American Institute of Architects. Um, there's going to be a state chapter for every state. So if you just Google, for example, AIA Colorado, um, you will find the AIA chapter. And they will, there are lots of resources that they have about how to become an architect and, and, and can go into a lot of detail. The, the pathway to get there for most students, if you're in high school and, and I've got one in high school now, um, you know, the, the, the main thing that you really have to do is you, you have to have a passion to get up every day and kind of want to push yourself to do a little bit better. From an education side, um, most states, well, every state controls their own licensing. So you do want to check, you know, if you think you're gonna live in Colorado forever, what does Colorado require? If you're gonna live in Georgia forever, what does it require? But there are some generally kind of national standards and the national standards really are, you have to have um, a, a bachelor's in architecture. So that's a five-year professional degree. Okay. Uh, if you don't go that route, you can get a master's in architecture. So if you get a, uh, a degree in philosophy, like I've, I've known people and you say, yeah, I need something a little bit more practical, um, you can go get a second degree, which you would just go get a master's degree. Um, and you need that. And then you need a certain number of hours, which um, basically is an apprentice or is a kind of... Um, uh, architect and training, but you, you, it, it, it equates to roughly three years, but you can start taking the tests um, uh, to become a licensed architect while you're accumulating your experience. So if you go right, you know, you can get through your education and you're really diligent on getting the experience you need, you know, you could be licensed as soon as three years out of school. That is absolutely incredible. And also, you know, achievable, especially if you're passionate about it. Cause yeah. I think sometimes once you find that hook, it's like, all right, not every day is sunshine and roses, but some yeah. days are really great. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, hey, I don't mean to throw you like a total softball question, but we touched on it earlier. Softball. How are you adjusting right now for the pricing? The oh, pricing. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the thing you learn doing this long enough, right, whether you're the contractor or the architect or you're somewhere in between, um, you know, markets rarely stay totally stable anymore. So the only, the only stability we really have is a kind of instability. Um, when you get something like the current moment, and, and we were talking, I think, all of this about this a little bit coming online is, you know, the, the price of wood right now is just I don't know what it is in Colorado, but it is astronomical here. So it's probably doubled in the last 12 months. So this is not what somebody who wants to build, you know, a, a deck is, as one of um, the group here was talking about. That is not what you want to hear, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yes. So, so it, it can make a fool out of a lot of us, you know, some of these changes. Um, what we try to do to mitigate that, and uh, um, I think contractors um, here do that as well, is you're trying to forecast out as far as you can what the market is, and you try to find alternatives. So, you know, if you can do it out of a, a structure um, out of light gauge steel right now instead of wood, that may be the better choice, whereas a year ago, it may have been a clear choice to do it out of wood. Yeah. So you have to kind of keep a little, we have to try to keep a little flexibility in how we think through some of these pieces and say, okay, well, if wood's kind of bananas on the price curve right now, then do I have a good substitute in my back pocket? If, um, you know, if next week it's uh, carpet, you know, was to go berserko because every plant got shut down in America for COVID or something, how would we adjust and say, okay, well, you know, is there other kinds of flooring? Is there tile? Is there, you know, whatever? And, and so I think it's forced all of us to be very flexible in, in larger areas and say, okay, here's a good substitute. And then there's places where you just, you know, from a design vision or, or technical need, you just can't compromise, but you know, you just have to stay flexible. Uh, agreed. Yeah. I it's um, so I, hard. <laughs> well, but it's also, I think it's good because 
being flexible keeps you sharp. You know, yeah. you're researching products. You are really on top of your game in the market to, to keep ahead of that. And yeah, yeah I've, Gosh, if I had known, I mean, I have oh. toilet paper and two by fours here. I'm going to retire. I'm, right. I'm set for exactly. life. <laughs> Buy a warehouse like just outside of Atlanta and stock up as much of it as you could. Yeah, and the and the hardest thing, and you know, for homeowners, I know especially if you're if you're doing renovations right now, you're you're thinking, oh my gosh, the interest rates are so low. Like, I really should go build something. Um, it. It is, it is really tough to, to, to hear, you know, well, we think it's going to come down, right? For the, like the last six months, we've heard every supplier and contractor tell us, well, we think the wood prices are coming down and then they just don't come down. <laughs> so, you know, so it's, it realized that, you know, maybe I, I guess I should say to everybody that is not in the trade, um, have some patience, <laughs> try, um, have a good bottle of bourbon nearby if you really need that. And then, you know, you, you have to understand that there is, there is a lot of things that we can't control, that, that, that the, the architect and the contractor just don't have control over. Like it was drywall after Katrina, like for, for, for a month, you could not find drywall very cheap because Louisiana was asking for half the production in the United States to rebuild. Yes. Yes. So what am I going to do? I mean, I, I don't have any control over that, so... <laughs> you just communicate with your clients. You have to communicate a lot. Yeah, I and think keep, the, keep their expectations aligned. Yes, it's huge. Um, thank you for answering that because I'm just curious. No, no, no. It's not my new favorite question. Like, what are your two by fours cost? <laughs> <laughs> well, I are. I can tell you what they were at Home Depot last weekend when I went in there. I mean, it was like a 14 foot two by six was like uh, almost 25 bucks a piece, which is just insanity to me. Yeah, I can't yeah. even I can't even fathom when it was remotely that expensive. No, our uh, three quarter inch OSB, a four by eight sheet, sixty six dollars. Yeah, it's I'm not the same. My, I don't understand that. Like I know, like, and none of us do. So everybody is again. That's not an architect. He's not a contractor. Yes. He's going. Y'all are just whining. No, we're whining because yeah. this is this is an extraordinary moment. This our our projects are expensive now for a reason. It's not just the brain yes. power. It's also and it's not because we like went careless and spending spending money. It's just <laughs> expensive. Right. Well, um, you know, obviously you're an architect, but there are other jobs in this speciality. Yeah. Um, what are the other members that you kind of rely on or work with? Yeah. So we 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 kind of, you know, there's usually three buckets on a project, right? There's the owner's team and and they're gonna have their representatives and people involved. And then there's the contractors team and the fabricators. And um, as much as we can, we like to work with fabricators early on because we we like the conversation back and forth and think um, they had definitely have something to contribute um, towards the the pushing of a design. So we think we get our best work, frankly, when we can work with them early on. And then there's the members of the design team. So. Uh, it could include, um, you know, in our case, for example, we work with a structural engineer almost every project. You know, we work with a mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers every project. Almost every project now, uh, that may not have been the case, you know, 25 years ago, you are going to work with a low voltage specialist. So um, AV, uh, audio visual, um, uh, information, you know, technology, uh, IT needs, um, security, all those sorts of kind of equations. And then, you know, depending on what the project is, if it's a museum project, for example, we are definitely gonna work with a lighting consultant, right? Because we wanna get really high quality, yeah. effective lighting. Um, we'll work with signage and graphics companies. We'll work with um, signage designers. We'll work with uh, cost estimators. So we do um, on a lot of our projects for the commercial projects, hire, uh, an independent cost estimator. So they're not a contractor, but they're dialed into the contractor submarkets, um, but they can help us provide some pricing guidance and the owner pricing guidance as we go through. So, you know, a lot of it just depends on what the needs of the project are. You know, if it's a fairly straightforward project, it might just be the mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers, um, and that's it. You know, some, but for the project like the net zero one I was showing the office building, I think we had 13 different specialty consultants on our team. That's amazing too. And I think it's really exciting to share with our fans because 
again, working in construction is not just sitting on a job site with a hammer. It is a variety of jobs that partake in influences. Yeah. Um, before we go and wrap up for the day, what's one piece of advice, advice that you wish you had known before you got started? Oh my gosh. Um, you know, I, I think um, the, the one thing looking back, I, I don't know that I, maybe I was naive when I got into this was where the architect fits into from a, you know, ability to influence the projects and, you know, meaning we have a lot of influence um, uh, in there where I think it's we're always looking to to bring our expertise to is a little bit more on that front end so when the owner's trying to make a decision about you know where what kind of piece of property do i want to buy for this you know where do i want to look at this you know what kinds of energy consumption are are available before they're kind of making the purchase of the land or before they're making the purchase of the building we love to be involved up front but we a lot of times just aren't so my pitch is you know, to answer your question, um, I naively thought we'd be involved all the way through <laughs> <You know, laughs> from the first time somebody had a, a in an inkling like, hey, I might want to build a house. Like, okay, well, let's go look at the properties. Um, you know, we, we tend to get brought in after some pretty big decisions have already been made um, on the whole. Um, and uh, that, that is probably a, the biggest difference between starting out and kind of wearing it now. Other than that, it's, I, I don't think I, you know, was going to, honestly, for me personally, I didn't think I was going to have as much fun working with the fabricators that, that I get to work with and, and go back and forth and have that kind of conversation and really get to push design ideas, um, very quickly and, and, and usually get to a better result than I would have gotten to on my own. So that, that part of it, I don't think was stressed as much when I started out. I love that you embrace that because I say often the best architects are the ones who know how yeah. gravity works on a job site. Yep. You know, it's and they get to play with the fabricators because we're yeah. first of all we're fun, but yep. you know there's that bounce and that and then it raises the bar on how awesome things could be. Yeah. So, um, oh my gosh. Um, well, hey, um, thank you so, so much. That for looks familiar. Um, <laughs> and we just brought up your contact information. I was going to say, great. that looks familiar. I know, right? <laughs> That's pretty cool. So if folks have any uh, questions or want to see more of your work, they can absolutely check absolutely. out your information. And um, Greg, again, thank you so much thank for sharing. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Yes. I hope a lot of people sign up now and like, oh, okay, I'll do architecture. Do oh. it, do it, do it. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, Thank you again. And so to all of our fans still hanging out, thank you for tuning in. And please join us next week where I'll be joined by Kate um, Kimono. I know I mispronounced her last name again, even though I wrote it on my hand. Nope. Uh, but she's going to be with Explore the Trades and I've hung out with her before. So it'll be a great interview. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to text Career Path to 31996 or go to sefka.org to check out all of our lunches. Greg, thanks again and have thank a you. wonderful rest of your afternoon. You too. Bye. Bye.